Well, hello, New Hope at Home and friends of New Hope that are watching tonight. It is Wednesday, October 11th, uh, 2023. So we're here at New Hope Presbyterian Church in Fort Myers on Plantation Road. My name is Beth Hoving, and I'm just honored as always to be here. Very excited about bringing you uh, the scriptures tonight. We always put the scriptures on the board that you all realize that's the order we go to them in. And it's kind of funny because there's only three. So if you're used to this, you know there's usually a whole lot more. And um, I was determined not to give you more than these because when this message was coming up a couple of weeks ago in me, uh, I wanted to, to really sit in these chapters. I didn't want to be doing too much flipping around. I will be referring to a lot more. If you have the, the uh, scriptures list, which you all can email me if you ever want those, email me, Beth at New Hope Fort Myers, F O R T M Y E R S dot org. I'll be happy to email it back to you with all of the kind of corresponding scriptures I refer to. But as far as where we're going to read from, these are those scriptures. And to me, it's just such a beautiful study. We've been talking endlessly about covenant. Hope you're not bored with this. But it always applies to what God is doing. God wanted to be in relationship with who? Us. And in Exodus 19, we see how God formed a covenant with the nation of Israel so that he could be in relationship with us and we could be in relationship with him. And that was all the laws and the sacrifices. But God called these people to himself. And we've defined, or I've defined, it's just me, it's not any formal thing, but as this reciprocal, yet unequal, relationship, love relationship with God. Reciprocal in that he invites us to enter in. In Exodus 19, you out of all the nations of the earth will be mine, my treasured possession. Obey me, keep my covenant. And then God promises to bless them and all through as we see the covenant being renewed. But it's an unequal because God carries it all, yet it's reciprocal because we enter in. And it's a love relationship that's for eternity with God. And within this covenant, and, and it's so important to understand covenant because we best understand it when we think of marriage. It is built on God's love. And he is that husband that never, never, never leaves, never rejects us. There is judgment on sin and God restoring us after we return to him. But he's the husband that never fails when we do. And so in this context of his unconditional love for us is where we flourish and where he makes us like himself. And we've been looking at that as, as the Bible teaches about that, prophet, priest, and king. God was all of that, modeled in the Old Testament through these offices that God implements, the prophets, the priests, the kings, who play out their roles, but in such a human, uh, uh, imperfect way. But when Jesus came, he became all that. He was the prophet, the word of God itself. He was the high priest that was perfect. He was the perfect sacrifice. And he was the king that because he emptied himself and became a priest was exalted the name above all names, which just put him right back into the glory in which he started from. So it's awesome when you think about it. And the reason we've been talking so much about it is because that's the kingdom he confers on us. As I've done, you go do likewise. This is the work that I go to do, though I'm going to the Father. Go and make disciples as he's ascending. What is he doing? He's calling us. This role is still for us, his word in us as the prophet. I'm not saying the literal prophet necessarily, but that spirit of prophecy as the priest that lives that sacrificial life and as the king who you can't be a king operating in the, the authority and the power and the, all the blessings of God if you haven't first been the what? Priest. You can't be a king until you've been a priest. And we've been focusing for the last many, many weeks on this priest role that in a word could be summed up as holiness. Priests are the holiness of God. They represent the holiness. They, they are the ones that stand between God and the people, representing the people to God. And what's so important about understanding that role is that there is nothing in us that understands holiness. There is nothing in us that wants to live a sacrificial life. It's completely counterintuitive, and yet it's what we're called to. And I think this is the role that we struggle with so much because it feels so holiness. I can't do that. Sacrifice my life. I know Jesus did that. I can't do that. And yet what? 
we are called to it. So for the last many weeks, we've been talking about how this happens in covenant. That God is developing. He's declared us his kingdom. You are my kingdom of priests, not just the Levites, but all of us, a nation, a holy nation, a kingdom of priests. And so within this covenant, God says, I've made you holy. He's declaring it, and then he's developing it in us. You are holy. I've made you holy. Now you enter in, consecrate yourselves. And he says in Leviticus chapter 20, I am making you holy. It's an ongoing thing. He declares it, and then he develops it. And this is what we spend our lifetimes learning. So we've been talking about covenant and holiness for the last many weeks and understanding how that works. A um, couple of weeks ago, we talked about the glory of covenant holiness because really he created us for that because he is holy so any of these last basically four messages if you've missed them and want to go back it would it would help you understand more and then last week we talked about covenant the suffering and the glory and if you didn't if you weren't here and you'd like to listen to that one i would recommend it because that's kind of what we're tying in tonight there is a suffering aspect to the glory that we receive in relationship with god because what happened on the cross the suffering, the worst moment in the history of mankind, the death of Jesus, the crucifixion of the Son of God, was also what? The one that ushered in the what? Glory of God. What was more glorious than the cross where Jesus died and conquered everything that Satan had erected on this earth and on his behalf, and Jesus conquered it. So there is so much to be said for that, and we're going to kind of pick up as we go. Tonight's title is covenant and the passionate pursuit of his presence three weeks ago i think it was the title of the message was covenant and the passionate pursuit of holiness and we talked about how we resist the enemy how do we really do spiritual warfare it's by pursuing holiness just like king hezekiah and we were back in first kings uh, 18 and, and first chronicles i think 28 and 29 but that passionate pursuit of his holiness that's just standing and letting God do the work of conquering that enemy anew and afresh every day. He's conquered, and yet he keeps conquering him in us, for us, every day. It's just this awesome, eternal picture. But tonight, covenant and the passionate pursuit of his presence. And I hesitated over the title because I could have, I could have said covenant and the passionate pursuit of knowing him or, or God's ways, because this is what we've been learning is God's ways, things that are hard for us to wrap our mind around because we take God and we think we figure out what he's doing and then our relationship with him and our faith in him and our view of him is hinged on whether what he's doing seems good and right to us. But that's not how to understand God. When we go to the Bible, we're not looking for him to fit into our world, we're looking for him to teach us about himself. That's what scripture does, so that we can see God and then look at our ways and realize how much higher his ways are than ours. And so we see God for who he is, and it changes everything. Because then you see him in his power and his glory and his holiness, and we're left to fall back and say, Lord, I don't understand everything, but I do know you. I do know your goodness and your holiness. And those are the things that keep us when we don't understand. And we've got the perfect situation now when we look at Israel. So much we could say about that. But God is a good God, and he uses the evil of the enemy to accomplish his greater purpose. That's just a fact. That's the ways of God. So Isaiah, uh, I don't remember what chapter in Isaiah, that he says, my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. As the heavens are high above the earth, so are my ways and my thoughts higher than yours. And so we rest in that knowing he's good. And this is kind of where we're picking up today. Knowing God has been his intent from the beginning of time. I wants us to go to Exodus 33. And I'm going to do a lot of reading here in Exodus 33 and into Exodus 34. But we've been talking about Moses. We've been to this passage so many times, and I love to be able to go back to them because we keep learning and gleaning things we didn't learn and glean before. There's always new truth. There's always something we haven't seen. And yet the repetition of it just really drives it home. So I'm hoping none of you ever again go to Exodus 19 and learn about God making that covenant with Israel and see it the same way that you ever did. I don't care that you think about us and our Bible study or me teaching that. But I hope that you look at and realize, oh Lord, you brought me to yourself. Not primarily to your laws, 
That followed, it had to, but he bore us on eagle's wings and brought us, what, to himself. That's not just the Israelites in Exodus 19. It is, but what else is it? It's the same story repeated in the New Testament. Jesus says, come to me, abide in me, learn of me. It's relationship. Old covenant in Exodus, new covenant when we get to the New Testament. It's the same message all through scripture, which is what makes it so exciting to tie together that it's not just studying Old Testament history. It's learning who God is and how he works, and ultimately it's all fulfilled in Jesus. Every single bit of this is all fulfilled in Jesus. So let's go to Exodus 33. I'll quit meandering. I could do that all night, and we'd never get to this. <laughs> Starting in verse 7. Now Moses used to take a tent and pitch it outside the camp some distance away, calling it the tent of meeting. Anyone inquiring of the Lord would go up to the tent of meeting outside the camp. And whenever Moses went out to the tent, all the people rose and stood at the entrances to their tents, watching Moses until he entered the tent. Look at the attention of the people. And as Moses went into the tent, the pillar of cloud would come down and stay at the entrance while the Lord spoke with Moses. Whenever the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the entrance to the tent, they all stood and worshiped each at the entrance to his tent, and the Lord would speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks with his friend. And then Moses would return to the camp, but his young aide Joshua, son of Nun, did not leave the tent. Moses said to the Lord, You've been telling me, leave these people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. You have said, I know you by name, and you have found favor with me. If you are pleased with me, teach me your ways so that I may know you and continue to find favor with you. Remember that this nation is your people. And the Lord replied, <clears throat> my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. And then Moses said to him, if your presence does not go with us, do not send us up from here. How will anyone know you are pleased with me and with your people unless you go with us? What else will distinguish me and your people from all the other people on the face of the earth? And the Lord said to Moses, I will do the very thing you have asked because I am pleased with you and I know you by name. And then Moses said, now show me your glory. And the Lord said, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you and I will proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. But, he said, you cannot see my face for no one may see me and live. And then the Lord said, there's a place near me where you may stand on a rock. When my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft in the rock and cover you with my hand until I pass by. And then I'll remove my hand and you will see me back, see my back, but my face must not be seen. The Lord said to Moses, chisel out two stone tablets like the first one and I will write on them the words that were on the first tablets which you broke. Be ready in the morning and then come up on Mount Sinai. Present yourself to me there on top of the mountain. No one is to come with you or be seen anywhere on the mountain. Not even the flocks and herds may graze in front of the mountain. So Moses chiseled out two stone tablets like the first ones and went up to Mount Sinai early in the morning as the Lord had commanded him. And he carried the two stone tablets in his hands. Then the Lord came down in the cloud and stood there with him and proclaimed his name, the Lord. And he passed in front of Moses proclaiming, the Lord, the Lord compassionate or merciful, and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in mercy or love and faithfulness, maintaining mercy or love to thousands, and some translations, thousands of generations, and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Yet, he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the sin of the fathers to the third and fourth generation. Moses bowed to the ground at once and worshiped. O oh Lord, if I found favor in your eyes, he said, then let the Lord go with us. Although this is a stiff-necked people, forgive us our wickedness and our sin and take us as your inheritance. And then the Lord said, I am making a covenant with you. Now this is basically, he's repeating that same covenant. They do this all the way through the books of law, most specifically in Exodus. This covenant gets repeated. <clears throat> I'm making a covenant with you before all your people. I will do wonders never before done in any nation in all the world. The people you live among will see how awesome is the work that I, the Lord, will do for you. Obey what I command you today. I will drive out before you the Amorites, Canaanites, Hittites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. Be careful not to make a treaty or a covenant with those who live in the land where you're going, or they will be a snare among you. 
break down their altars, smash their sacred stones, and cut down their Asherah poles. Do not worship any other god, for the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous god. The reason I wanted to read that whole thing, and we're going to go back and look a bit at it in parts, is I wanted you to see kind of the whole picture. We're not quite done, but for this minute we are. Notice the verses that I kind of want to really pinpoint and draw your attention to is in chapter 33, verse 12, where Moses says to God, You have said, I know you by name, and you have found favor with me. If you're pleased with me, teach me your way so I may know you and continue to find favor with you. Look at what's happening here. I know, you know me by name. Teach me your ways so that I can know you too. See? You know me. You've called me. I want to enter in with you. I want to know you. Do you see the intimacy of that? To know God. 1 Corinthians 13 a verse that, that's so powerful for me, says that now we see through a glass darkly, that's the old vis, uh, version, or it, it, through uh, as in a mirror dimly. Those old mirrors, you know, they were not clear like ours today. So you, it seemed like in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now, I know in part, then I will know or know him fully, even as I am fully known. God fully knows us. And I think for me, there was nothing more that met my deepest need as the Lord began doing more in my life than understanding how fully he knew me. Not just to intellectualize that, say, oh yes, I know you've searched me and know me, I get that. But that I experienced, Beth, I know you and I'm pleased with you. Not because of anything that you've done that's so pleasing, but because what? When God entered in relationship with us through those sacrifices in the Old Testament, which was just picturing what? The cross. Jesus, acceptable in his sight, pleased with us for no other reason that he died for us. And we said, yes, I want that. I accept that. We're he is pleased with us. Learning about God's ways. You can't learn about God's ways if you don't learn about who he is. And what happens in this passage is it teaches us who he is. And I want you to notice that Moses' appeal to God, teach me your ways, is hemmed in already by God's declaration. In verse 12, Moses said, you've already said, I know you by name. We see that when he calls Moses at the burning bush. What's he calling? Moses, Moses, by name. So God had already said, I know you by name. I found, you have found favor with me. Then Moses says, Lord, teach me your way so that I may know you and continue to find favor. And then in verse 17, the Lord says to Moses, I'll do the very thing you've asked. Why? because I'm pleased with you and I know you by name. You see God's love and acceptance for, for Moses already established, and within that, Moses is declaring his love and allegiance to the Lord. He's hemmed in, he's carried, he's helped. And Moses really asks for three things here. He asks, number one, for God's presence. You've told me to take these people, but you haven't told me who you're going to send with me. He asks him to show him his ways, Give me your presence. Give us your presence. Show us your ways. Show me your glory. Show me your glory. Why does he want to see God's ways? What was the purpose in wanting to know God's ways? Teach me your ways so that I, what? Verse 13. Teach me your ways so that I may, what? Know you and continue to find favor with you. Let your presence go with us, because if your presence doesn't go with us, how's the nations going to know we, you are pleased with us? Your presence is a demonstration of your pleasure, and it sets us apart. What else, it says in verse 16, what else will distinguish me and your people from all the other people on the face of the earth? What did he say in the covenant? Out of all the nations of the earth, you will be my special possession, set apart. That's what it means to be holy and sanctified, set apart. And Moses is connecting, if your presence doesn't go with us, the world won't know. Your ways and your presence. And then show me your glory. Show me your glory. And God says what? Yes. Yes. First of all, my presence will go with you. 
In verse 14 of chapter 33, the Lord replied, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. Now, why is that such an important statement? That's kind of assumed. Well, of course, God was leading the Israelites. We know he was with them. Well, understand the context of where we are in chapter 33. In chapter 32, Moses has been up on the mountain with God for 40 days and 40 nights. And while he's up there and God's giving him all these laws and gives him the Ten Commandments, God tells him in chapter 32, you need to go back down that mountain because these people, they're already acting corruptly. So what's gone on? They built this golden calf. Huge, huge thing. So God has told them, look at chapter 33, verse 3. Go up to the land flowing with milk and honey, but I will not go with you. So Moses is saying, if you don't go with us, how in the world are we going to go? Now in verse 4, chapter 33, verse 3, and then verse 4, when the people heard these distressing words, they began to mourn, and no one put on any ornaments. What's happening? There's some repentance. God was never not going to go with his people. But what's happening? Moses is interceding for those people. Those people are hearing God say, you have displeased me. I cannot send my presence with you. And what happens? It sparks their repentance. Do you see that? That's one more of those sin things. God had a perfect plan for the nation of Israel. Sin entered the picture. They're broken. God says, I can't... I can't do what I want to do in you because of sin. They say, oh, Lord, forgive us. There's that repentance. We've been through these three circles before, which is what? Leads them right back to restoration. God brings them back to what that perfect will is. He's restoring them all the time. This is that ongoing, and I won't get back off there because I won't get through the rest. But these are God's ways. My presence will go with you. It is assured. It was always assured. And then the most beautiful thing Moses has said, I know you know me by name. I know you're pleased with me. And God says, I will let you know me by name too. I will let, verse 19 of chapter 33, I will cause all my, what? Goodness to pass in front of you. Moses is asked to see God's glory. God says, I'm going to show you my goodness. My goodness so that you can experience for yourself who I am. Look at chapter 34, verse 5. In chapter 33, we see God saying, I'm going to let my goodness pass. You've asked for my glory. Now, this is kind of a continuation of what we've been talking about. The goodness of God, the glory of God, the holiness of God, the grace of God are all his characteristics. His holiness, his glory contains all those characteristics of who he is. You can't separate them. And this is exactly what we see in chapter 34. Verse 5, Then the Lord came down in the cloud and stood there with him and what? Proclaimed his name, the Lord. And he passed in front of Moses proclaiming the Lord, the Lord. He's saying, Holy, holy. That's what that capital L-O-R-D means in your Bible. That's the highest form of of the name of God, holy. God really didn't need to say anything more. But notice when Moses asked for his glory, God says, I'm going to give you my what? My goodness. My goodness. And then he goes on to say, when my glory passes in front of you. And then when his glory, his holiness comes in front of him and God identifies himself and says, holy, holy, he goes on and describes what that is. Merciful, compassionate, what? Gracious. Slow to anger, abounding in love and mercy and faithfulness. That word gracious, what does that remind you of a word in the New Testament that we hear all the time? Grace. Grace. A God of grace. That's my name. To know by name, in, in the scriptural sense, to know by name means a familiarity. It indicates there is this, this special identity, this special familiar relationship that I call you by name differently than I might call the rest of the world. So there's a relationship here. This is the most awesome part. There's this relationship. Moses has said, Lord, show me who you are. And God said what? I'll do that, Moses. I know your name. You can my know, know my name, and this is what it is. Holy, glorious, so powerful that you can't look me full on, but I'm full of grace. Yes, I judge sin. He's a just God. But what was all that leading to? What is God doing? He's identifying who he is. In John 15, where we started last week, the scripture says, when Jesus is talking about persecution, they're going to treat you this way because of my name. 
for they do not know the one who sent me. That's why people didn't accept Jesus. They didn't know the Father. He says that to the Pharisees again and again. And in John 1, 18, it says what? No one had ever seen God. But the only begotten, or the only God, or the only begotten Son, those, you can hear those translations wrestling to say he's God, but he's man, and he's flesh, and he's God's Son, but he's God. The only begotten in the bosom of the Father has come to what? Make him known, to declare him to interpret him, to bring him out where he can be seen. Jesus was God's expression of, you want to really know me? Here I am in the flesh. This is what I look like. And he's giving Moses that picture standing on this mountain in the Old Testament. It's the picture of grace. God's intent from the beginning of time, from creation, was that he would be known by us. Why do you think he walked with Adam and Eve in the garden? Why do you think... He said, the Trinity said at creation, let us, us three, make man in our image, or the New Living Translation says, to be like us, <clears throat> holy, mm -hmm. not perfect. We started out that way, but that was never going to last. He made us like him so that we would be in relationship with him. And so when you think about John 17 and Jesus' prayers just before he went to the cross, and he says, Lord, this glory you've given me that I've given them, that's an awesome statement, by the way. That's an awesome statement. And he said, that they might be one as we are one, I in them and you in me, that the world may, be, may know that you have sent me, that they may be made perfect in one. He's talking about that union with God, that union with the Father. We were created in Psalm 8 with what? Crowned mankind, crowned with glory and honor crowned with it before we ever knew him. This is what God created us to be, to be like him, and he wants us to know him and to be in this intimate relationship that's the whole covenant picture, a special possession. It's a marriage relationship. It's the whole picture all the way through scripture. Jesus, the bridegroom, and us, the bride. God in the Old Testament, the jealous husband, the lover. That's all pictured all the way through scripture, that we would know him intimately this is what he's letting moses see here's who i am god is revealing himself in his ways and his glory is simply his presence it's simply him here in us among us with us his glory is in us and he wants us to know him see we're not just <laughs> We're not just looking at some Old Testament incident that goes, okay, I can see where God lifts his characteristics here. He's loving. I'm so glad to know that. And yes, we do want to know that. But I want you to understand that when we see scripture, it's not simply something that was isolated to that period of time. It's still alive. I'm not just pulling something out of context here because all of scripture backs it up. This is what Jesus came to do, reveal the Father. And to do what? Reveal what? His grace. Why did he come? To conquer death so that grace might reign, Romans 5 says. That no more would sin reign unto death, but grace would reign unto righteousness. How? Through Jesus Christ. So therefore, don't let sin reign in your mortal bodies, he goes on to say in chapter 6. That's our entering in. That's our participation. But this is simply who he is. And God's glory is in his presence, his ways. How do you get to know God? Spend time with him. Spend time with him. It changes us. Go on to uh, chapter 34. I'm going to skip from verse 15, the next 10 or 12 verses. It's God's just reiterating those basic laws, these festivals. Here's what I'm expecting of you. And this is Moses. Now he's up the mountain for the second time. And God says in verse 27, Go back down, write down these words, for in accordance with these words, I've made a covenant with you and with Israel. And Moses was there with the Lord 40 days and 40 nights without eating bread or drinking water. And he wrote on the tablets the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. When Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of the testimony in his hands, he was not aware that his face was radiant because he had spoken with the Lord. When Aaron and all the Israelites saw Moses, his face was radiant and they were afraid to come near him. 
But Moses called to them, so Aaron and all the leaders of the community came back to him, and he spoke to them. And afterward, all the Israelites came near him, and he gave them all the commands the Lord had given him on Mount Sinai. When Moses finished speaking to them, he put a veil over his face. But whenever he entered the Lord's presence to speak with him, he removed the veil until he came out. And when he came out and told the Israelites what he had been commanded, they saw that his face was radiant. Then Moses would put the veil back over his face until he went in to speak with the Lord. I think this is awesome, that he is radiant because he has spoken with the Lord. And we just saw in the previous chapter that he talked with God face to face as a what? As a friend. This allness that God is, the holiness, the glory, the, the power that was so awesome, the glory that was so unfathomable that in his flesh he could not have tolerated it. And yet, he spoke to him as a friend. Do you see that? It's just Song of Solomon. It made me think of that scripture in Song of Solomon that says, He is altogether lovely. This is my beloved. This is my friend. Do you see that intimacy that he has with God in all of God's splendor and glory? There is still this one-on-one -on -one relationship with Moses that Moses is experiencing for himself who God is and where I'd like to go when we get back, and I'm quite sure this is where God's leading, is that understanding of Moses is what? Experiencing God for himself so that he can what? That glory that's shining on his face, and we're going to read about it where we're going next, is what draws other what? People. People. That's the goal. That's the goal. That we know him, know him intimately for ourselves so that we then can go out and be living letters. Read of all men. Let's go to 2 Corinthians 3 because that's exactly what's happening. And we're going to exactly read what happened in Exodus 33. You probably all know the story of Moses and his face shining, right? How many of you all have heard that before? <clears throat> nothing, nothing new, right? Okay. And you probably will, we, will be familiar with some of these scriptures in 2 Corinthians 3, but I want you to understand what's happening. Verse uh, 7, Now if the ministry that brought death, which was engraved in letters on stone, what's he talking about, the Ten Commandments, but let me help you understand when he said, if the ministry that brought death, what is he talking about? This gets a little tricky, so just try to hang with me. Well, the but the law, the law brought death. But sometimes, if we're not really comfortable with Scripture, we say, well, why would God bring something that would kill me? Read chapter Romans 5 and Romans 7. It, it helps flesh it out a little. But the law was perfect and beautiful. But Romans 8 tells us it was weak because the flesh is weak. The law depended on us keeping it. Why do you think he had all the sacrifices set up in the Old Testament? So that when we can't keep the law, the sacrifices cover us all the time. So the law was intended to show us we can't keep it. And God, in his mercy, set up this system so that we would still be acceptable to him. So the law is perfect and beautiful. God's plan is beautiful, but man can't keep it. And so we were doomed by the very thing that could have saved us, which is why Jesus came. It's so beautiful. If the ministry that brought death, which was engraved in letters on stone, came with glory, so that the Israelites could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of its glory, Fading though it was. Understand, his glory was fading, and this is so awesome. Will not the ministry of the Spirit be even more glorious if the ministry that condemns men is glorious, meaning the law that we can't keep it condemns us, how much more glorious is the ministry that brings righteousness, eternal life through what Jesus did? For what was glorious has no glory now in comparison with the surpassing glory and if what was fading away came with glory how much greater is the glory of that which lasts the glory that lasts remember i was telling you last week the glory that, that god's working in your life yes the glory of eternity we know that but scripture when it talks about that glory god's eternal he's doing it all the time so when he's developing this glory in us teaching us about himself usually at the, at the end of a period of suffering there is glory that's developed in us, and it lasts, guys. Those are the treasures we're storing up in heaven, that glory that we take with us. When he invites us into these kind of relationships and we say, oh, yes, Lord, take me, he's giving us a picture of heaven on earth. Not a picture, but a reality. This is what we're going to be experiencing perfectly there. And here he gives us 
an increasing amount of his glory. And because the scripture is going to say it right here, verse 12. Therefore, since we have such a hope, we are very bold. We're not like Moses who would put a veil over his face to keep the Israelites from gazing at it while the radiance was fading away. Now this next little section, I'm just kind of called a parenthesis. But their minds were made dull, for to this day the same veil remains when the old covenant is read. It has not been removed because only in Christ is it taken away. Even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil covers their hearts. But whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. What is he saying? The veil over the face, only as you turn to Jesus is it taken away. It's just like the Pharisees, who just absolutely refused to believe Jesus could be Messiah, even though he fulfilled all those prophecies, and they knew them better than anybody. Why? He was not what they wanted. He was not what they had in mind. And so they refused to consider, it's not a yearning to believe more, it's simply a refusal to consider or believe that he might be the one. But when you turn, Jesus, is it you? are you the one? What happened? The veil is taken away. Because it's in Christ. You see, that's what everything God did was to be revealed in Christ. That's what this whole passage is talking about. So I was kind of saying, look at that as a parenthesis, where the Spirit of the Lord is in there is freedom. That's how he opens our blind eyes. But in verse 13, it ends, uh, Moses would put a veil over his face to keep the Israelites from gazing at it while the radiance was fading away. Verse 18, and we, but we, who with unveiled faces all reflect or contemplate or gaze upon the Lord's glory are being transformed into his likeness with what? Ever increasing what? Glory which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. How do we see his glory? Moses got to see it on a mountain. How do we see it? We're becoming it. How? As we gaze at Jesus. Not glance, gaze, contemplate, reflect mentally, not just, a, not just a reflection as in that we look like him. That's a wonderful way that we're, works both ways here. But as we are reflecting on him, we are actually coming to look like him. Back up to chapter 3, verse 3. This is exactly what happens. That glory is being developed in us. With Moses, it was like on the surface. Marvelous as that was, is what Paul is saying here, the Holy Spirit is saying here, that he's done a deeper work in us. Chapter 3, verse 3. You show that you are a letter from Christ, the result of our ministry, written not with ink, but with what? The spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. What is he saying? You're a different person. People look at you and know there's a difference. That doesn't come from just quoting scripture at people. That comes from being intimately acquainted with God, who bestows on you his glory in ever-increasing measure as you're pursuing and seeking him. Why? So that people see him. They see him. Jesus came to reveal God. We are supposed to be revealing who God is through Jesus. Not because of all the scripture that we know, although please know scripture, but go to it with the understanding of, God, show me who you are. Let me know your ways. Teach me who you are. Verse 4. Such confidence as this is ours through Christ before God. Not that we are competent in ourselves to claim anything for ourselves, but our competence comes from God. Paul's talking about himself here as a minister. He has made us competent as ministers of the what? New covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. This life that he gives us, and that's what he goes on then to explain about this radiance. Absolute radiance. Go back to Exodus. We're, we're going to come back to 2 Corinthians in a minute. But I want you to go back to Exodus. And I want you to turn to chapter 24. So if you, get, if you go back to 33, back up to 24. This glory of the Lord, as we gaze upon Jesus, this is the first time that God calls Moses up that mountain before he gives him the first tablets. Verse 12 of Exodus 24. The Lord said to Moses, 
Come up to me on the mountain and what? Stay here. Go to verse 18, same chapter. Then Moses entered the cloud as he went up on the mountain and he stayed on the mountain. How long? 40 days and 40 nights. We read just a few minutes ago in chapter 34, and that, by the way, that's his second time up the mountain, in chapter 34, that he was there for 40 days and 40 nights again and ate no bread and drank no water. The number 40 in the Bible, and we can point this all out from ever, represents a time of testing and trial, but also triumph, victory. The Israelites, the 40 years of wandering, it was a time of test and trial, but their faith triumphed. They learned who God was. They learned to trust him. Jesus in the wilderness, the trial, the temptation, but what? The triumph over the enemy. Mm -hmm. Moses up on that mountain, suffering. Remember that what's the context here? All of this sin that the Israelites in chapter 24 were going to commit. <laughs> By 32, it's full out there. By 33, Moses is back up the mountain before God. So this is a test, a trial, and yet the triumph is what? The glory of God is revealed to Moses, so much so that he's actually sharing in it. Even though it's superficial because it fades, there's a sharing in that glory. The suffering led to the glory. Do you understand? This is how this works in our lives. How do we get to be living letters? How do we get to be living letters? Well, it also didn't have very much effect on the, the Israelites, the, the original ones, because they all died in the desert. Uh, yeah, yeah, correct, correct. We see that when they set out for... But God was growing their faith. The, the purpose that Maybe I'm bringing out... Maybe their children, out, but not theirs. Pardon me? Maybe their children, but not theirs. There was a generation, you're right. But they're also... But that began those 40 years. They were all moving out. You see that like in Numbers 10. Okay, let's go. God said enough time around this mountain. And then what happens? They don't have the faith. So it isn't really judgment that God is making them wander. It's a time of their faith has got to be increased. But praise God, see, he never gives up. There's always new beginnings. There's always the next generation. God was working to develop this in his people, and the glory was the faith that brought them to the place where they can settle the land that he promised to give them. They were the kings. That was the prosperity. But first, but first, they had to learn to trust him. We become living letters by living this. We become understanding what the gospel is when we literally live it in our insides, when we grieve, when we're grieving over Israel, and we say, Lord, the only way to have any peace in this or any hope in this is to see it through the context of your word and your goodness and your power over evil and the fact that you use these things. You have a plan in this. I don't have to understand all about it, but I can grieve. When we start living out and God starts changing you, you feel the suffering. You feel the pain. The things that are, are happening in you, when God is dealing with you about sin in your life, it hurts because he starts digging around in roots and he digs it around in the way you've always defined yourself. He said, I don't want you to see you that way. I want you to see yourself the way I see you, through the lens of what I call holy, what I call righteous. And suddenly all the things you hung your head on start falling away and you're left floundering. Well, then who am I? Without this, who am I? That doesn't happen overnight. That doesn't happen in one prayer session. That happens over a period of time as God is developing a deeper work in you. What's that called? He's developing glory from glory to glory. But within that, there is a suffering. And Moses was experiencing a level of suffering. Go back to um, chapter 34 of Exodus. So go back to where your sticky was. And I want to focus on this section. After Moses has seen God, God has declared his name and passed before him. And God said this, I'm making a covenant with you, which is not a new covenant necessarily. He's simply reminding him of this covenant. But he says in verse 10, I'm making a covenant with you before all your people. I will do what? Wonders never before done in any nation in all the world. The people you live among will see how awesome is the work that I, the Lord, will do for you. Obey what I command you today. I will drive out before you all these enemies. Be careful not to make a covenant with those who are living in the land where you're going, or they will be a snare to you. Tear down all their stuff. Don't enter in. Stay way away. Don't worship any other god, for the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. 
God is doing wonders. John 21, 25 said that it all Jesus and all Jesus did, if all everything had been written down, he said, I don't suppose the whole world had room enough to, con to contain all the books and the things Jesus did. In John 14, Jesus says, I tell you the truth. When he says that, it's an important statement. I tell you the truth. Anyone who has faith in me will do what I have been doing, and he will do even what? Greater things than these, because I go to the Father. When we're reading here about the wonders before all your people, I will do wonders never before done in any nation of the world, and they will see how awesome I am. Yes, of course that's in Exodus. Of course that's in when they go in and conquer the promised land. But is that limited to that? No way. That's what Jesus says. You're going to do greater things. God is preparing us to do great things. How? Through all that he's just revealed to Moses. This is my glory. This is my goodness. This is my power. This is my holiness. This is grace. That's what he's saying. And all that description of himself. And what is it? Now. In us. Not just absorbed from the outside. As glorious as that was. That's exactly what we just read in 2 Corinthians 3. Wonders. Wonders. God wants to do so much. Jump back to 2 Corinthians. And I want to jump up to chapter 4. So hard to read 2 Corinthians 3 and 4 and 5 and, and just not keep going. Remember I told you about the suffering. All these glorious things about this, this glory that comes through us that we're made to look like Jesus. And then in chapter 4, we see the glory but we see the suffering. But we have this treasure. Well, let me back up to verse 6. For God who said, let light shine of darkness, let light shine out of darkness, made his light to shine what? In our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in what? In the face of Christ. It's why we gaze at him. That's the glory of God, and it's in our hearts. It's in us. We just read that it's, we're morphing into that image with ever-increasing glory. And in verse 7 it says this is a treasure this treasure, but we have it in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing, what? Power, this glory, this holiness, this power is from God and not from us. We are hard-pressed on every side. Hear the suffering? You ever been hard-pressed? But we're not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. Why? Because, verse 10, we always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake so that his what? Life may be revealed in our mortal body. The suffering and the glory. It cost Moses on that mountain 40 days and 40 nights fasting, but in his suffering did God sustain him. Yes, and it led to Moses not only seeing God, but actually experiencing the glory, knowing him by name, firsthand, so powerfully that he looked like him when he came down off the mountain. But it faded. See, that's the beauty. Do you understand what's offered to us? I don't think we understand what's offered to us. Because it's absolutely life-altering. Turn to Philippians chapter 3. And I want to read it to you in the Amplified Version. And I'm just going to tell you, there are so many words, no matter how slowly I read it, you're going to go, wait, what? Because it's so awesome. So if you don't have an Amplified hard copy Bible, you can pull them up on your phone real easy, right? And go back and, and study this. Go back and look at this for yourself and understand the passion that's roiling out of Paul as he seeks to find words to express what he wants. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pick it up in verse 8. I count everything as loss compared to the possession of the priceless privilege, the overwhelming preciousness, the surpassing worth, and supreme advantage of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord and of progressively becoming more deeply and intimately acquainted with him, of perceiving and recognizing and understanding him more fully and clearly. You see his passion? What is it in a, in a nutshell? 
to know him. But to know him means to experience that gut level, all that he is. Verse 9, and that I may actually be found and known as in him. Do you see how closely his identity is, 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 is contained within who God is, who Jesus is? Not having any self-achieved righteousness that can be called my own. In other words, nothing that the law said would make me supposedly right with God. But possessing that genuine righteousness, which comes through faith in Christ. Verse 10, and I just love this. I could just sit on this one line. For my determined purpose is that I may know him. My determined purpose is that I may know him. Paul has gotten hold of the power of who he is. And he said, I've left everything else aside because there's nothing else worth knowing. This is my determined purpose. And that I may become progressively more deeply and intimately acquainted with him, perceiving and recognizing and understanding the wonders of his person more strongly and more clearly. In that same way, to know the power outflowing from his resurrection, which it exerts over believers, Remember, we learn in Ephesians 1 that power that raised Christ from the dead is the same power that's alive at work in us so that I may share his sufferings as to be continually transformed to his death in hope that if possible, I may attain to the spiritual and moral resurrection that lifts me out from among the dead even while in the body. So I said it's a mouthful, and I didn't even read every single word there. But what is he saying? That I might know him, and as I know him, even living in this body, even before eternity, that resurrection from the old life, there's this new life actually living out of me, even while I'm still basically in this body of flesh. The glory, he was a hold of the glory is what was happening. He says, oh, I just keep pressing towards that. I haven't gotten there. I keep pressing towards that. It's not, a, it's not a goal to attain. It's a journey to be on, but it's that ideal in mind to know him. Just turn back to chapter 1, verse 29 of Philippians. We looked at scripture similar to this last week, but I can't help but take you here. For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for him. <laughs> to suffer for him. Romans 8 tells us that that suffering doesn't compare with the glory that will be what? Revealed in us. The glory that will be revealed, yes, in eternity, but also tomorrow. As I'm growing in him, I'll be more glorious tomorrow than I am today. These are the treasures I take with me to heaven. See, the more you get hold of that, the more you can look at this world and hold it loosely. This is part of the problem. We don't Hold it loosely. We, we are numbed so much by what's going on around us. Experiencing the glory of God, the holiness of God, the goodness of God, the perfection of God happens what? Knowing him happens what? In his presence. That means being present with him. That means spending time with him. And on a purely practical note, how many of us know the people you love the most, how well would you know them if you didn't spend a lot of time with them? Mm -hmm. You know their facial responses. You know when they're mad. I know when my husband's tired before he knows he's tired. Because I've lived with him long enough. I know how he is when he's tired. When you love somebody, you are with them. If you're flying out the door and passing like two ships in the night, you might know, yeah, that person's there for me and I love them. But you will not have that bond that you can have with a person that is yours in this life, that shares your life. It could be a husband, it could be a friend, it could be a parent. I'm, I'm specifically speaking of marriage, but I'm saying it, some of us that aren't married, you don't have to just look at it that way. The reason I was excited is this, as I said, this message was coming up so powerfully a couple weeks ago for me, and I thought, well, Lord, do you want me to teach that this week or next week, meaning last week? But I was very glad that he had me teach what I did because we're not meeting next week. I know a couple of you are new, but we're not meeting next week, which means this whole, in the, in the morning it was two hours, in the night it's more like an hour and a half, but there's a chance to invest that same hour and a half for you 
Where? In the presence of God, knowing him, passionately pursuing his presence. And I know that some of us start with 10 minutes. If you're starting with 10 minutes, praise God. That's great. But listen, it, it, this is not a, a reprimand or a command, but, but I am beseeching you. The glory is found in extended time in his presence. This is what happened to Moses. Extended time in his presence. This is what happens. Through his word, I think somebody said this morning, I think somebody said this morning, that God's word to us is how he speaks. It's as if this is his face. He comes alive through his word. This is how you know him. But when you spend time in it, in his presence before him, things change. What did Moses say? Teach me your way so that I may know you the way you know me. And how do you know me? By name. And God says, now you know me by name. In Exodus 34, that little section I read you about the covenant, really what God was saying is, I'm making a covenant with you. Obey me. I'll take care of those enemies. Don't make a covenant with somebody else. I'm a jealous God. You see that terminology. What is he saying? And he says, don't, don't make a treaty or a covenant. Don't give your heart away. Don't give your heart away. This is what he wanted from the Israelites. This is what he wants from us, our heart, those inner motivations. And I don't know what keeps you, or if anything keeps you, from investing the time with the Lord, either feeling like you don't have the time or you just can't sit still. And believe me, <laughs> 20 years ago, I really wrestled with this. And it's only been really the last, oh, I don't know, five years where I would begin to understand what it meant to really spend time with the Lord but specifically in the last three or four years. Something else has got your heart. And we don't think of it this way because we're numb. We'll say, well, no, I'm just busy. I gotta sleep. I understand. But listen, when you can't sit still, you need to find out what is it that you can't sit still for. If that's your problem, ask him. Notice what's going on. Well, I've got this and this to do. What are you placing your value on? Well, I'm tired. I get it. Somebody told me once, and this is the most powerful answer I've ever heard about how to spend time with God when you've got a lot of stuff going on. And I thought, this will carry me the rest of my life, and it has. You know what the answer was? So be tired. Oh, I can spend my time with God because I got up earlier, even though I got to bed late. I'm a little tired the next day. But am I more, am I, am I more glorious? You see how that changes your thinking? Yes. What are you really living for? See, we have numb hearts. We passionately pursue other things, but we don't know it. We don't know they're that important. I didn't know all that stuff was important. I just thought I'm a busy person. I can't sit still. All that's true. You can see I don't sit still. <laughs> but the real truth was there were so many other things pulling at me, and I, didn't, I was not conscious that it was my heart was set on other things. When we get down to the root of it, it's about your heart. Remember the priests. They spent lifetimes pursuing everything that was holy. It was their life's work and their life's pursuit. So before you say, well, yeah, but that was just the Levites. That's just the preachers. What did God say? Yes, he appointed the Levites. But you will all be for me a kingdom of priests. I want a holy nation. These are the leaders, but I want a holy nation. And remember that those Levites were just one of those 12 tribes, every one of them not great men. If you want to pick two tribes and say, well, which are the holiest, wouldn't you think Levi, where the priests come from, and wouldn't you think Judah, where Jesus himself comes from? And yet read Genesis uh, 34 and 35. These were not good men. Those people were appointed. They were regular people that God appointed and worked through to accomplish his purpose. And yet the Levites, after the debacle with the golden calf, Moses said what? Who's on the Lord's side when he came down off the mountain? Who rallied to him? The Levites. So even though they are called, they also volunteered and came forward. And those are the ones God set aside. So what do we do about our hearts? If it's our hearts, and this is a continuation of what we've been talking about for weeks and weeks. If it's our hearts... I made the comment, I can't keep my own heart. 
I was beginning to realize, I can't control my heart, these impulses. And I'll read you out of my journal what, I, what God was showing me. But here's what, here's what I wrote that just kind of rose up in me. I'm just going to read it to you because this is what I feel God spoke to me. But like a beloved husband, so in love with him and him with you, so intimately and satisfyingly joined together, that though the temptress and the seductresses come, you're with this person that you love, you're, I'm talking about Jesus, but I'm pointing to my husband. Though those temptations come, I can't be seduced away. Why? Because I've given my heart to him, and he keeps it. Remember I said I can't keep my own heart. I can't. But he keeps it. I give it to him, and I give it to him, I give it to him again and again. Now, an earthly husband is only going to put up with adultery so many times, right? Going to find something else. But God never does. God never does. And he keeps it. Remember in uh, John, I can't remember the scripture, and I have it written down somewhere, but it's not coming to me. No one can snatch them out of my hand. Jesus said, Father, these are the ones you've given to me. No one will snatch them out of my hand. And my Father, who's even greater than me, no one can snatch them out of his hand. So we are kept, we are held, we are hemmed in in covenant in his love for us. But he is inviting us to enter in and respond. He keeps my heart. So I was asking the Lord, God, what makes it so hard? What what makes it so hard, the more I'm sold out to, the harder it seems to be, or the more I seem to fail. The more aware I am of my failures is probably really what it is. But here's what God kind of revealed to me in my prayer time. How great the battle for my heart continually, my flesh and the enemy and the world. Eve didn't even have the world's cultural pull then. But that narrow gate I forced myself through, he did battle for me. He fought successfully for me, but I must do battle with my heart. See, we've got to find out what's in our hearts. You're just like me. You're, there's things there that keep you from him that you call by a different name. Well, I don't love it more. Yeah, you do. Trust me. <laughs> you do, but you don't know yourself deeply enough. He hasn't brought enough to the surface for you to see. And though I worship him and I love him with all my heart, Lord, I love you, I find I really don't. I question him, yet again, his allness. I feel deprived, even as I tell myself, oh no, that's, not a, that's a lie, Beth, you're not deprived. But I want to believe I'm deprived. Why? In my deepest place, I do. So then I can entertain whatever thing I lust for without restraint. Whatever thing I want, if I can convince myself, I deserve this. I'm lacking. You see what I mean? Then what are you saying? God is not all. God is not all. What a pull this flesh holds and exerts over me. Born to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. And I keep believing it'll be over, whatever those sinful pulls, and I'll be completely his. No more stirrings to push back on. No more hunger for what I know will kill me, because we know from Genesis 3, sin is what? Well, not bad for you. He doesn't say it's bad for you. He says it will kill you. It is deadly, and yet... I want what I know will kill me. See, this is the human condition. This is what I'm telling you. But it'll never be. It can't be that that's all gone. Because I'm in this body until he comes for me. And Paul knew this. That's why he's pressing through to know him in Philippians 3. It's the curse of sin. Praise Jesus. It's broken, but yet we overcome, not overcame. He overcame. I continually overcame come in his victory, his shield, his love and power to trample on sin. But I rejoice in the gospel, my hope, because I will always need him. That song that says, if I'm not dead, you're not done. And the battle is real and keenly felt in my flesh. <clears throat> Jesus in the garden and in the wilderness, that battle, where did he get relief? Off to spend time with his father. And every time it feels new, what I've learned or what I know about God, how far I've come, doesn't seem to matter. <laughs> Though I know it does, I know he has me, I know he's proved himself to me, I know my faith is alive, but the battle gets underneath my skin, underneath all that armor, and I have to learn it again, more deeply. I encounter him again, more powerfully, more comprehensively. It's broader, his word and his voice come more quickly and more distinctly. You see, that's the glory that presses, but we have to press in. 
and the rescue comes again, and I rest in the new same truths. It's Jesus, him, himself, all. My father, the gardener, Jesus, the vine. God, the top of the ladder, Jesus, the ladder collecting, connecting heaven and earth, both mine. And then it's over, and I feel light in my soul. That's what it looks like, because that's us. That's why we can look and say, I am absolutely bankrupt without him. I never would have been able to say that. I would have said it. I wouldn't have had an understanding of what it meant. We can't keep our own heart. You don't have to deny or disown what's happening in your flesh in order to embrace what God is doing in your spirit. Let me just quickly... God, here's spirit, and here's flesh. I'm going to draw just dotty lines around the difference between flesh and spirit because we're not totally isolated. And I'm going to do spirit like this because there is no end in him. It's always eternal. And in the spirit is my new life, new birth, God's perfect ways, his truth. glories. And we read last week in uh, I think First Peter, the sufferings and the glories, it's plural. But here's my flesh. Here's my old life, my old nature. My life, my everyday life. My realities. Whatever it is you're struggling with. My suffering. Sufferings. We're all suffering. Every time we're standing up and praying for somebody that we're grieved of in our family, I'm probably going to ask any one of you, are you grieving over somebody that you love? That's a suffering. This is what happens. God is leading us to the glories, to his perfect ways and truth, but in between my flesh and my spirit is this tension. And that's that press-through place in the presence of God. Lord, teach me how to see what you're doing, and I know I'm giving you a lot. This is really kind of springing out of what we've been talking about for weeks and weeks. So if you're new and this feels overwhelming, you might get some insights out of some of the other studies. But this old nature, these sufferings, we tend to want to deny what's happening here or call it by a different name. And I just want to tell you, whatever you've had going on in your life, you don't have to deny or disown what's happening in, in your flesh to be able to say, Lord, help me see through all of this. Because in, in this suffering, there's glory, really? Because when it's going on, all I see is this. There's things i got to deal with. This is a situation. I can't just stand back and wait for the glory. That's not really how it works. But it's, Lord, help me to see what you are doing in this. There is nothing the enemy can bring that God has not restrained or released him under God's authority to do what he's accomplishing. He's always in control. The devil is not in control. Yes, he has some play in this world, but he is not completely running rampant. If God's presence were removed from this world, can you imagine what the enemy would be doing to every one of us? Mm -hmm. Can you imagine? There's not a good thing in him. He is utterly evil and utterly destructive, so God is restraining him all the time. We saw that in the Old Testament. The suffering in the glory. God is doing something in your spirit, and what is he doing? Taking you into deeper glory, just that we read in 2 Corinthians 3.18. We are being transformed as we gaze at Jesus into his image, what? From one degree of glory to the next, by the spirit of the Lord. Your story, your past, your whole self. Most of us spend lifetimes sorting out our, if I could just get this settled from my childhood, or these things happen, and we spend a lifetime sorting out who we are. And good for you, we need to. I found wonderful help in understanding more of what makes me tick, so to speak. But what was even more glorious is understanding that my story isn't really a story. My story is contained in his story. It's already done. It's already finished. It's already, as my friend keeps saying, it's already written about. He's already got it. And so everything that I'm fighting with is just the sufferings and the glories. 
the real satisfaction is not from understanding my life here ok good i'm good now it's taking it and placing it in the bigger picture of this is what god's doing in every one of us your story is your story and it has your uniqueness but it's all the same thing it's the sin in the world it's the sin in me it's a sin in other people it's the force of the enemy it's a culture of the world and god is living out through us so that these glories shine through us so that what so that we really are not just seeing the glory like Moses did, but being it. We are being it. When we are living letters, we are being the glory. And when we're being it, we're showing it. People see it. They say, something's different about you. Or you're not doing that thing anymore. Or I don't know what's changed in you, but I've known you your whole life, and this has got to be God. Well, I've been told that. Well, they kick you in the teeth for it. Well, yeah. It's part of the suffering, isn't it? Part of the suffering. But God is doing something glorious. And when he's doing something glorious, there's going to be kicks in the teeth. Because right? the enemy don't want that. He doesn't want that. This is part of that press through, Rob. That's part of that press through. Lord, I know what just happened. I know how I feel about it. And I know it's not right. You're exactly right. But I know, Lord, that you are always working those things to teach me something for me to press through, not fall under the power of the enemy and say, okay, now I'm angry and bitter, like any normal person would be. We're not supposed to be a normal person. We're supposed to bring that normal person stuff to him and say, okay, Lord, here's how I feel. Here's what happened. It's wrong. And yet, you say, you want to show me your ways. You want glory to come through this. And I have the privilege and the capability of living different, of being that living <coughs> letter. Learning what it means, the priest, now I've taken that down, the sacrificial love, and that's where I think we're going next week, talking more about the priest. Well, not next week. I won't be here next week, so take a week off. At you at home, there won't be a new recording. But I don't know about you, but these things absolutely have completely transformed me and how I see God and what I'm going to do in this life in the next, as I've said, how many decades I have left. I don't know. If I live to be a ripe old age, I have two or three decades left. I'll take that. But whatever I do, whatever comes in my life, pleasant or unpleasant, in that period of time, I've got my eyes on eternity. This is going to pass in a flash. So if it's suffering, that's going to pass, and then there's going to be glory. And if it's all great and good, well, I'll enjoy it, but it's not going to compare to what's going on there. So you see what we live for? We really do set our eyes not on what is seen that is temporary, but what is unseen that is eternal. And God is working an eternal glory in you. Read that in the rest of 2 Corinthians 4. <clears throat> this glory that far outweighs everything that you're going through here. I promise. Learn to understand what suffering means. Call it suffering. We just go, well, I'm just not sure I like this situation. But stop and think about what's going on. What is God teaching you about himself in that situation? What are you learning about what's in you that needs to change? Because the holiness brings the joy and the glory. You understand. You become your best self. Your best self, what God intends you to be. And when you get a taste of that, nothing stops you spending time with God. Nothing stops you pursuing him as your answer. Nothing stops you knowing you used to have all these holes in yourself that you were trying to fill. And suddenly they're full. Suddenly they're filled. Now you've got something to actually give. And what is it? It's the presence of God in the midst of suffering. And it's not fun, guys. No suffering is fun. But let's call it what it is and see it as it is. Thank you, New Hope, uh, that's at home. We'll see you in a couple of weeks. Join us again. I appreciate your tuning in. And sure am praying that God is making this real to you like he's been making it real to me. See you soon. So.